Okay. Robert Canigal. I'm going to read his little blurb. Robert Canigal is the author of seven books, including The Man Who Knew Infinity, uh, which won a which won a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. I mean, he was a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. And On an Irish Island, which I guess he's going to read from today, uh, just out in a vintage paperback edition. He's currently at work on a biography of Jane Jacobs, who wrote Rise and... The life, and death of the life and death of American cities, which should be pretty interesting. I, I don't know why I keep saying rise and fall. Um, Robert is the recipient of numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a native New Yorker. He first came to Baltimore in 1966, lives on Calvert Street. He left for San Francisco in 1971, returned in 1975, left for Boston in 1999, returned to Baltimore in 2011. This time he says he's back for good. See robertcanigal.com. Come on. Okay, so let's see if this works. Does it work? Okay. Um, since coming back uh, from Baltimore, I felt really buffeted. Um, we've been back about a year and a half now, and what has happened again and again is that I'll see a street scene, or I'll see a building, or I'll see a neighborhood, and one of them will be absolutely identical from what I remembered in 1999, which is when I left, unchanged completely, like a picture taken and nothing has changed, and then I'll go to some adjacent neighborhood, some other place, and everything is completely changed, and it's nothing like what I remember. And so I've started, I've needed to try to get used to this, which has not been easy at my age, adapting to, adapting to these sorts of changes. One of the changes is, is Station, Station North. Uh, this, I don't think there was any Station North at the time that I left in 99, maybe just the bare beginning, but certainly nothing like the, the kind of energy and, and vitality that I see evidence of. So this is actually the first time I've been here, but uh, I expect to be back much more, much more often. We're still, re we're still um, re acclimating to Baltimore after these years away. It was a mistake to leave, but I'll never <laughs> make it again. Um, let me tell you about this book that I just um, had finished. When I was in Boston, before I left um, Baltimore, I had written three books, including the one about the math genius, The Man Who Knew Infinity. And when I was up in Boston, I wrote uh, three more, including this one, on an Irish island, uh, which had its genesis uh, with my marriage. I was married in 2005, and uh, we had to decide where to go for a honeymoon. And uh, somehow or another, I, that part I really don't remember how we settled on Ireland, but the initial thought was we'll go to Dublin or someplace like that. And then all our friends dissuaded us. Boy, that's stupid. You know, you can, your cities are all sort of alike in some ways. Why don't you go to the west of Ireland? And that's what we did. We went to uh, Dunquin, and which is all the way as far west in Ireland as you could go. And um, the day after we got there, or two days after, we started, you know, it's time to explore. This is 2005. Uh, time to explore. And what happened is we stumbled upon this uh, museum and exhibition center devoted to a place called the Great Blasket. And um, what it is is this, this rather large place. It's got archives. It's got beautiful panels, it's got the local boats that people used back then, it's got, uh, there's, there's a whole literary tradition associated with the island, and so they have big panels giving examples of the kind of writing that came out of the island, and I was really entranced by this place, and that led about a year later to um, uh, starting work on, the, um, on an Irish island. On an Irish island, uh, 
the original, the, we have two copies of the book that you can buy. One is the hard cover that came out a year ago, and the other is the soft cover that is coming out next week, and there's a difference between them. The difference is that uh, the hardback does not have a subtitle. I was very proud of this at the time. I pushed my editor, why don't we have a non-fiction book that does not have a 50-word subtitle? And I pushed for this, and we got it, and it was fine. However, uh, with the coming out of the paperback, they pushed back, and they wanted a, a subtitle, and the, the subtitle now is The Lost World of the Great Blasket. Um, but one of the titles that I was flirting with for the longest time was um, Happiness Among Sorrows on the Great Blasket. And I think that in some ways characterizes the peculiar place that this was in the early years of the 20th century. The book is called On an Irish Island, not an Irish Island. It's not a history. It's about what happened on this place in the years between about 1905 and 1945, 1950. And basically, this is an island that had about 200 people living on it, all of them Irish-speaking, uh, that had none of what we would think of as necessary facilities and requirements of life. Uh, it had no electricity, it had no plumbing, it had no shops, it had no church, it had no pubs. It had nothing, it would seem, but 200 people living a simple peasant existence and exulting in the pleasure of being with each other and working with one another and um, a lot of dancing, a lot of uh, uh, singing and uh, folk, folk tales amongst them and a close kind of in-your-face life. You know, you're going to go home tonight and maybe some of you will watch television um, or go see a movie. There's a screen and there was nothing like that. This was these were lives with one another, with other human beings, close up all the time, uh, fishermen and a little bit of agriculture. And my book can be viewed in one way as an account of the island, and it can be viewed in another way as an account of the visitors to the island, which I'll get to in a minute. And it can be viewed, I think, in a third way uh, about what's Obviously, much is gained in, le in going from a simple peasant economy to uh, a big city. But something is lost, too. And I think the book asks us to consider what may be lost as well as gained in that transformation in going from one world to the other. The thing that happened on this island is that, first of all, if you look at the, the map, it's as far west as you can go in Ireland can't go no further. And what happened with the Irish language, which we usually call Gaelic, but the people there usually call Irish, is that it got banished further and further west, and England, English took over. And in the early years of the 20th century, people who wanted to hear Irish needed to go across the face of Ireland, and it was um, consigned to relatively small areas. And there was, a, there was an upsurge of interest in Irish nationalism and in the Irish language and Irish culture during those years. People went there, scholars, writers, linguists, and they fell in love with the place and in some cases fell in love with the people that they met there. And um, my book is about essentially a clash of cultures between people who picked up from London and Oslo and Paris um, and went across the Irish Sea and then went across the, uh, the country of Ireland and wound up on this little island off the west coast. So I think what I want to read to you uh, is a section about one of those visitors, one of those scholars, a French woman. And tell me if this is not working. She was extraordinarily gifted, a sterling product of the French academic system at its best. Marie-Louise Stochtet was 24 when she first came to the Great Blasket in July 1925. Six years before, in the spring of 1919, scant months after the end of the World War, 
she had appeared at the Sorbonne in Paris asking to study with the eminent linguist Joseph Vendry and embark on the next step of the academic ladder, the licence. Linguistics was the discipline in which she proceeded to gather licence, aggregation, diplôme, and the other badges of the French system. Who does not remember recalled a classmate who took a course with her devoted to the Greek verb? That striking young girl with the pretty, appealingly childlike face in her pearl necklace, leaning wisely, almost severely, on her notebook. She studied Latin grammar. She studied Czech. She spent the summer and early fall of 1921 in Bohemia. She studied Russian, flirted with Slavic studies, later traveled to the Soviet Union. Always it was language in all its intricacies that beguiled her. She had many choices as to what to do next. In a way, too many. Her family was well off. The immediate prospect of a job needn't contaminate her choice. But one of her advisors, Antoine Maillet, one of France's most esteemed linguists, perhaps determined not to see an intellect of such promise lost to dilettantism, pointed her firmly toward Celtic studies. For the academic year 1924-25, she was awarded a lectureship that left her amid the stone quadrangles of Trinity College, Dublin. There she met a variety of key figures in the field, and there too, almost certainly, she met Sean Cavanaugh. Uh, what you need to know is Dunquin is the small village facing the Blasket Island on the mainland. As it appears today on a plaque on the Dunquin house in which he lived for many years, a few hundred yards from the sea and across the sound from the Great Blasket, his name was Sean Cavanaugh. But so universally was he known by a nickname that it too appears on the plaque, Sean Ancoda, Sean of the Kilt, for the garb he wore in his youth. That's how Mary Louise may have known him even in Dublin. That is, if she didn't simply call him Sean Og, young Sean, as she did later when inscribing a book to him. Born in 1885, he was actually older than she by 15 years. Sean was an adventurer. A year and a half out of jail, when Mary Louise met him, he'd taken the wrong anti-treaty side in the Civil War. That would require about an hour to explain. The wrong anti-treaty side in the Civil War and wound up in the military prison called the Karach. Before that, he'd spent six years in the States. As girls and young women in the parish remembered him, he was a roguish charmer, a lover and admirer of all womankind. In prison, he'd tell of sexual jaunts in a turf rick with a Dunquin woman when he was 15, she 45. He was oddly handsome with a luxuriant head of dark hair and exotically high cheekbones. A prize fighter's face, according to one who knew him in prison. Mobile, humorous, bohemian, with a gold crown tooth and a winning smile. In 1915, age 30, Sean left for America. Whether he intended to emigrate or not is unclear. What is clear is that he didn't settle in Springfield, Massachusetts, like practically every other Kerryman, or in Boston. He didn't settle for long anywhere, in fact, but traveled around the country. He worked as a riveter in a New Jersey shipyard, in a Chicago steel mill, on ranches in the Dakotas. When he returned to Ireland in about 1922, he wrote an Irish language novel based on his experiences. It was published in 1927 as Fanai, The Wanderer. This Zane Grey-like adventure yon, thick with ranch life and black-hatted villains, spiced with romance, takes place in a town near the border between North Dakota and Minnesota, the last stop on the line north to Canada. When a train loaded with farm workers pulls into the depot, most of them head off to the riverbank to fill their rusty pots with water and to light campfires. One of them, though, lies by himself in the grass, stiff from work before finally trudging off alone to town. A classic American Western in the making, except that the protagonist isn't some Luke or Jed, but Sean O'Lonigan, Irishman, thoughtful and bookish, who's drifted west by one telling in response to the undefined promptings of his heart. Sean O'Lonigan's free-spirited creator was the man Mary Louise befriended when after her year in Dublin, she first visited Dunquin and the Blaskets. He was from the first day I landed in the parish, my kind, loyal teacher, 
she late, wrote later of him, a guiding light for me with eternal patience, a co-researcher who shared with me his knowledge of the people and of the area. It fails me to describe the value of his help. Both love language. Sean, whose first language was West Kerry Irish, had taught Irish under the auspices of the Gaelic League. And even in prison, he ran Irish language classes for fellow inmates. Kerry Irish was his passion, as it now is hers. For long stretches, set against the area's rocky coves and precipitous heights, they were inseparable. Roasting mackerel and open fires, rowing together across Smurwick Harbor into a rising gale, the little bay's waters rough and turbulent around them, basking in summer soft seascapes, he her teacher, she his brilliant French companion, tall, pretty, and fresh. Under the circumstances, it would have been easy for something to develop, a friendship, an abiding intimacy, a full-blown full -blown affair, and something did. Sometimes, by what we can glean from Sean's writings, they'd head off for a rocky precipice high above the sea, within sight of the Blaskets, that today's maps call Cloger Head. It looked like the site of some cataclysmic eruption, some great gray boulders heaped atop one another, lichen and bits of vegetation clinging to them, interspersed with soft, sheltered beds of turf speckled with wildflowers. The sea breeze might roar in from the north, but here, in these nooks among the upturned rocks, they'd be protected against wind or prying eyes. If they wanted to be alone, way out from the coast road, this was the place. Here there were, quote, only seabirds around us, Sean would recollect, and the sound of the surf, beautiful, peaceful, without a sorrow in the world. If Sean's perhaps fevered memories are to be trusted, Marie Louise, more to him, was at one point ready to marry him. He procrastinated. When he realized too late what she meant to him and said so, she was cool to him. One story heard in Dunquin has him going to Paris to see her, her spurning him, him tossing the engagement ring he had for her into the sin, into the sin. Did Marie Louise mail it merely use Sean as an entree to the world of Dunquin and the Blaskets? Or to resort to an equally pat and proverbial formula, was she simply too good for this West Kerry yokel? The classicist Stephen McKenna once intimated of Sean and Coder that he was more an artist in life than creative artiste himself. He possessed a gift for jest and conviviality, a wonderlust. He was an eloquent raconteur, a fine talker. He must have been great to pal around with in Dunquin and on the island. But for all the encomiums Marie Louise lavished on him in print, and the good times they spent together on those rocky headlands, she may never have considered him a potential life's companion. Later, when it was all over between them, Sean set to compiling a written record of Kerry Irish. The final treatise, never published, fills 29 handwritten volumes in the National Library of Ireland. His way of getting at an odd word or phrase was to offer a dictionary definition and a few sample usages, then sometimes a brief scenario or vignette to express its meaning. Above all the beautiful women in the world, he wrote, Moro is my sweetheart, the one I love with all my heart. That's how he, how he illustrated one West Kerry usage. In fact, when Sean's biographer counted vignettes that seemed to refer to Mary Louise, he came up with 42. Most tell of a broken heart, fairly writhing with loss and longing, as in, my girl abandoned me, the woman I loved and courted. But for the world, fear, miracle, he wrote, I never met anyone who understood the miracle of Irish as Maura did. Thank you.